we're going to get started. So we're starting stereochemistry today. We're going to finish chapter four and we're starting stereochemistry. Stereochemistry is sort of one of those dreaded chapters for students. I hope I can make it not be dreaded. Okay, so um, if you're worried that you, that you uh, don't have good spatial skills, um, I'm going to show you ways to, to work around that. Okay? So where'd we, where'd we leave off here? We're talking about oxidation and reduction. We're not going to spend too much time on that because we're going to come back on to this topic in chapter 12. So um, I just wanted to talk about the fact that we have methane here. We lose a hydrogen. We have to have both of these things happen at the same time. We lose a carbon hydrogen. We gain a carbon oxygen. Okay? And every time we go across, let's, do, let's just do uh, ditto marks all the way across. And when we do that, we can take methane all the way to carbon dioxide. All right, so we, we very heavily rely on this um, for our heat and energy needs. Um, if you look at the following graph, atmospheric CO2 at the Mauna Loa Observatory, and um, you can see how the CO2 is rising, 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 rising. Okay, so then you see where it comes from, from um, oxidation of hydrocarbons. All right. Last part of this chapter is lipids. We're going to very briefly talk about lipids. We will keep coming back. So this is lipids part one. We're going to have lipids part two on next quarter, lipids part three in the third quarter. So lipids are biomolecules or properties resemble those of alkanes and other hydrocarbons. And the fact is, and, and, the, and the main fact is that they uh, are not soluble in water. So here's some examples here. Um, here's a component of beeswax and we have a, a um, long, long carbon chains. This is a prostaglandin, PGF2 uh, alpha. So this is a prostaglandin. Don't need to, uh, I'm not going to be testing you on these names. But you can, what you can see is that we have long, we have a lot of carbons and not very many heteroatoms here. So definitely you would predict that to be insoluble. And here the most famous one is um, cholesterol. We have all carbon hydrogens except for one hydroxyl. And this is actually really important. It's a vital component of the cell membrane. This hydroxyl is oriented towards the aqueous interior. And of course, a vital component of cell membrane. All right, so lipids have high energy content because they're composed mainly of carbon, carbon, and carbon hydrogen bonds. They're oxidizes with release of energy, just like alkanes. The only difference is it's in our bodies rather than in our automobiles or our heaters. Okay, that leads us to um, chapter five. It looks like we're still having technical difficulties, so we'll get to that point when we can, if we can today. Otherwise, I can just show you, hold up the things and show you. So stereoisomers, new terminology here. It's a type of isomer. So we, we rarely just say isomers because we want to be more specific. Stereoisomers are compounds that have the same atom conductivity but a different arrangement of atoms in space. So if you, if you describe this compound, for example, you'd have a carbon-carbon double bond. This carbon's bonded to a chlorine and a hydrogen. This bottom, the carbon is also bonded to a chlorine and a hydrogen. This carbon's bonded to a hydrogen and a chlorine. This bonded to hydrogen, a hydrogen and a chlorine. Okay, so we have, the same, we have the same connectivity, but we have a different orientation in space. So for this one, um, this chlorine is up and that chlorine is down. So they are stereoisomers of each other. And likewise, when we have a ring, this bromine here is up on the top side of the ring, chlorine is down. So we could call that trans, right? That would be trans. This would also be trans. So um, we would call, so we have this one, the bromine and the chlorine are on opposite sides of the ring, bromine, chlorine on the same side of the ring. So of course, we already introduced this terminology. This would be trans. This is cis. This is trans. And this is cis. 
So those are stereoisomers of each other, same molecular formula. Same connectivity. That means all of the atoms are bonded in the same way to the same atoms. Uh, we have a different um, arrangement of atoms in space. Another example of this is starch and cellulose. And starch and cellulose are, are made up of uh, repeating glucose units. This is a glucose that's in a ring. There's a glucose, there's a glucose, there's a glucose. And we have completely different properties. The only difference between starch and glucose, I mean starch and cellulose is, see the orientation of this bond right here? See how that's axial in starch? Everything else I promise you is exactly the same. Um, right here, however, that orientation, that's equatorial. And that one little tiny difference makes a completely different physical properties. So here we have glucose, let's label this, glucose. Glucose and likewise glucose and glucose. And again, the only difference here, axial and equatorial. And it turns out that that one little bond there has, makes these compounds have completely different physical properties. So cellulose um, basically ends up being a flat molecule. You get sheets of it. And then they hydrogen bond with each other. So there's no hydrogen, there's very little hydrogen bonding in the exterior of the cellulose. So it's water insoluble. Even though we have the exact number of carbons and oxygens here. Um, starch on the other hand, because of the orientation of this bond, it, it, it makes the molecule go into a helix. And so in that helix we have a hydrogen bonding with water all along that helix and kind of towards the interior of that. Your book has a really good picture of it, but um, anyway, so that completely changes it. So that um, starch, the helix, water soluble. Cellulose, which is, gives rigidity to trees, to the trunks of trees. Tree trunks and plant stems. water insoluble. We'll talk more about both of these um, compounds when we get into 51C. It's actually the last chapter where we talk about carbohydrates, but we certainly know that the trees don't dissolve when it rains. So we know that, the, that, that cellulose is not water soluble. So pretty amazing. All right, let's talk about enantiomers, chirality, and symmetry. So some new terminology here in addition to stereo isomers. So any molecule, indeed any object, has a mirror image. Some molecules are superimposable on their mirror image. Um, that is, all atoms and bonds in a molecule can be simultaneously aligned with identical atoms and bonds in its mirror image. When this is the case, the molecule and its mirror image are identical. So here's an example here. Um, I'm going to do a little dotted line. That's really like a mirror is in between those two compounds. So if this molecule was looking at itself in the mirror, it would see this image, right? All right, so, um, but are, so, so these are mirror images of each other. Are they superimposable? Um, don't know if you can imagine this. We're going to do it on the Elmo in just a minute here. Is that if I take this molecule, if I pretend that this is a book right here, and this is on the left-hand side, you have the book open in front of you, and if I just take this, molecule right here and I just flip it like that. It will go right on top and all the bonds will line up. Okay? So 
The mirror image is superimposable. on um, the original molecule. And if the mirror image is superimposable, they are identical. So molecules are not superimposable on their mirror image. When a molecule and its mirror image are not congruent is another term that you'll see. Um, congruent equals superimposable. So these two worm, uh, words are the same. Choose the one you like that makes more sense to you. They are different molecules. Any molecule or object that cannot be superimposed on its mirror image is chiral. A chiral molecule and its mirror image are enantiomers. So um, let's, let's do our little mirror plane between these two molecules. So um, this one's red, this is green, this is blue, okay, and then we have the yellow on the top. And if we, so if we do the same exercise that we did up here, this is the spine of a book, this is the left hand side, this is the right hand side, and we just took this molecule like this and we flipped it over. Do we, and we want to see if the bonds are going to line up. And so I'm, what I'm seeing is this bond, when I flip this molecule over, that met that green bond right there. When I flip that over, um, that green bond is going to be going back, right? It's coming up, you know, and I, when I flip it over, it's like this. So it's up now. When I flip it over, it's 180 degrees. I'm flipping. So this green is going to be back. Well, this green's forward. So it looks like what's going to happen when I flip that, the yellow is going to line up, the red's going to line up. But the blue and the green are not going to line. Well, the, the, that's actually, it's hard, a little hard to see. Two of, them are, two of the bonds are going to line up and the other two are not. Okay, and, and we'll see it all better on the ELMA when I do that. So these, of course, are uh, mirror images. The mirror image. is not superimposable. Any molecule or object that cannot be superimposed on its mirror image is chiral, a chiral molecule, and its mirror image are enantiomers. So that's, that, what that means is these are a pair of enantiomers. a pair of enantiomers and uh, each enantiomer is chiral. Yes? So chiral is like an adjective for it? And e yes, so each one is chiral. So your hands are chiral. Okay, so they're mirror images of each other unless you have something going on, right? Um, they're mirror images of each other. So each hand is chiral. They're mirror images of each other. If you try to superimpose them, and some people say, okay, well, I'm just going to go like that. But no, you'd have to have palm to palm. I mean, if you're going to superimpose them, everything has to line up exactly, right? And so um, if I have it like that, then one thumb's here and one thumb's there. They're not superimposable. And so really the best example for that, and I can show you that right here, is um, gloves. So there's two kinds of gloves. There's the flat kind that can go on either hand, right? That's not chiral. Because we could, well, we're going to talk about how to look for, look for that, but um, that glove can go on either hand. That's a flat glove. But then there's also the kind of gloves that where the thumb is like right on this side. It's actually made to fit onto a left or a right hand. Okay, so these guys are um, mirror images of each other, right? But if I try to superimpose them, I can't go like that because that's palm to palm. I have to flip it over like that and, well, what's going on here? Yeah, so these, see how that? 
they're not lining up exactly. So, and then, the, of course, the best way is just to try to put it on. Okay, so that one's meant for the right hand. If I try to put it in the, on the left hand, then um, the thumb's all, it, it's str pulling across the top of my hand and the thumb's in the wrong spot, right? Okay, so there's the best example of chiral. We have our hands, so if you ever forget about what chirality is, you just have to look at your hands, they're chiral. Okay, so really important for um, you guys are, um, a lot, most of you are bio majors and certainly when we have enzyme active sites, those are chiral. So we have to really understand what chirality is, okay? Because only one enantiomer is gonna work in that active site. All right, so let's draw these guys on the next page. And then we're gonna talk about how to look for chirality. Oh, I guess I'm not drawing these on the next page. Am I on the right one? Okay. Yes. Natromeric molecules have the same relationship as right and left hands, and natromeric and hands are chiral. Molecules or other objects that are not chiral are said to be achiral. So active sites of enzyme, important. Our noses are also chiral. We can distinguish enantiomers. So here's a molecule called carvone. There's plus carvone and there's minus carvone. Uh, minus carvone smells like spearmint oil. Notice these are mirror images of each other. They are also not superimposable, so they are enantiomers. So the one, minus carbone smells like spearmint oil, plus carbone smells like caraway seeds. So completely different smell. Receptor sites for the sense of smell are chiral, just as active sites. So here's some, a couple of compounds um, where, where they're gonna behave differently in the body. This is ibuprofen, so uh, this would be the active ingredient in things like Advil, Motrin, things like that. And the RNA, the RNA uh, isomer has uh, no anti-inflammatory action. The S isomer is actually the active isomer and this, this is the one that has um, anti-inflammatory action. So chirality is really important for um, people who are, are synthesizing drugs and designing drugs. This is a compound thalidomide. This is uh, before your time, but this was made um, huge headlines, mostly in Europe because it really wasn't available in the United States, um, although some people were able to get it. But this was a drug uh, back in the 50s that was taken for uh, morning sickness. So in pregnant women, morning sickness. And it turns out that uh, one of the one of the enantiomers of this compound, the R plus, we'll talk about where the R comes from and where the plus comes from coming up. But this particular an uh, enantiomer is the one that actually helps with the nausea. Um, the an the enantiomer, um, the other enantiomer, uh, is the one that's a teratogen, so damages developing fetus. And what it did is it affected the limbs on the, on the babies when they were born. So they were missing, like they only had half arms, they were missing all the limbs. And there's a bunch of people who this happened to a lot in Europe, very much a lot in Europe. So um, it was discovered too late that that was the problem. And actually, uh, these, are, these drugs are still available and they're used for some types of cancers. So they're actually very effective, but of course they don't give them to women that are pregnant any, any longer. All right, so how can we tell if a molecule is chiral? All right, let's do that. A couple things to look for. Two things we're going to look for. We're going to look for a plane of symmetry. So a plane of symmetry divides a molecule or object into two equal halves that are mirror images of each other. An object that has a plane of symmetry is is superimposable on its mirror image and is achiral. Chiral molecule does not have a plane of symmetry. All right, so here's butane. 
and it's drawn in the anti conformation. If we rotated butane around this way, this would be the, we, we, would, we can call this the front view. And if you see, there is a plane of symmetry. So what that would be like is that, um, I'm going to put it as a dotted line. You're probably not going to be able to see it, so go ahead and do that on yours and it should be able to show up a little better for you. So, so what we can do is we have a plane of symmetry. So it's like we, we sliced this molecule in half. And that half is the exact mirror refraction of that half. Everybody see that? And we actually sliced these atoms in half, and that's okay when we're looking for planes of symmetry. So um, that, this, this side is exactly the same as that side. So we would say that this molecule has a plane of symmetry. Uh, what does the plane of symmetry look like? Um, let's draw it right here. So this is in the eclipsed conformation. So the anti-conformation has one plane of symmetry. This is the eclipsed conformation, and it actually has two. So this would be the eclipsed conformation. So here's a dotted line here, and th this has a plane of symmetry that goes like this. So we can, you can imagine, you know when you butterfly a steak, you go along the length of it, you slice it that way. That's what we did right here. We're just laying this on its side. So we can slice that molecule this way, and the top half will exactly match the bottom half. We can also, there's also a plane of symmetry here because this side of the molecule is the exact mirror reflection of that side. So that plane would look something like this, where we're cutting it in half this way. So we can, we can go this way and we can also go that way. So those two planes are perpendicular to each other. I try to do it as, show it as best as I can. Now, if we, do some, if we make a really simple change here and we take one of the hydrogens of butane, one of the hydrogens that's in the middle, and we change it to a chlorine, so that would be this right here, so I'll draw your attention to that. We no longer have a plane of symmetry. So this is 2-chlorobutane. There's 2-chlorobutane. And so I've tried the anti-conformation. I've tried the eclipsed conformation. And all these planes of symmetry are gone because if we try to have a plane that just kind of goes right through your page right straight down, um, this chlorine would have to match another chlorine on that side and it doesn't. Okay, so um, there's no plane of symmetry that way. There's no plane of symmetry this way because this chlorine doesn't match that hydrogen. We would have to make that hydrogen a chlorine also. And we, we're not, we can't do that So because it's a completely different molecule. So um, no planes of symmetry. So therefore, the molecule is chiral. So that's one way we can look for chirality. We can also look for chirality by looking for a tetrahedral atom with four different substituents. A tetrahedral atom that has bonded to four different substituents constitutes a stereocenter or a chiral center or a stereogenic center or you will also see chirality center. All of those terms are, are interchangeable. So um, if there's one chiral center only, so this, this compound for example has one chiral center because we have a carbon and we usually signify it with an asterisk. That carbon has four different groups attached to it. So if there's one chiral center only, there um, is no plane of symmetry. And the molecule is chiral.
So I've signified the chiral center, the stereo center, the stereogenic center, the chirality center, all of those words. That's the chiral center. Or stereo center. Those are the two, two terms that I will use. So um, notice up here, we said this molecule is chiral, and we, and, we, and we noticed it was chiral because we couldn't find a plane of symmetry. But if you look at this carbon right here, this carbon is attached to a chlorine, a hydrogen, an ethyl. This whole group is an ethyl, and this is a methyl. It's attached to four different substituents, right? So that's a, that's a chiral center. So this one's also a chiral center. All right, so if we have one chiral center, the, the molecule is automatically chiral. Automatically chiral, okay? If, however, we have a, we, if we have a, um, a, a compound where um, any two substituents are the same, so if we have any two substituents the same on a tetrahedral carbon, it doesn't matter what they are, if any two substituents is this, are the same. on a tetrahedral carbon, that carbon is a chiral. All right, so um, going back to this compound right here, if this hydrogen was also changed to a chlorine, we no longer have a chiral center and the molecule's achiral. So, so, if, so the reason this is chiral is because you know, here's our front view of this molecule. That's the chlorine, right? And that's why we don't have a plane of symmetry if that becomes chlorine. But if this side uh, also became a chlorine at the same time, now we do have a plane of symmetry and it's achiral. So look for uh, stereocenters, carbons, tetrahedral carbons with four different groups attached. If you have one of those in the molecule, the, uh, the molecule is automatically chiral. If you have, um, and let's draw 3D structures for this. And we'll just use ET for our ethyl. Save us a little time here. That would be one enantiomer of 2-butanol. This would be the other enantiomer of 2-butanol. This one on the left is minus 2-butanol. We'll talk about what that minus means um, coming up in just a few minutes. Minus 2-butanol, this is plus 2-butanol. To change from one enantiomer of 2-butanol to the other, you actually have to physically remove two bonds from your model and switch them. Okay, so that's, that's the difference there. If you have two or more chiral centers, the molecules can be chiral or achiral. We'll see examples of that. Can be chiral or achiral. More at the end of the chapter. Or just more later in the chapter. So if you have a tetrahedral carbon with four different substituents and there's only one of those in the molecule, your molecule is chiral. If you have more than one tetrahedral carbon with four different substituents, the molecule can be um, chiral or achiral. And again, we're going to talk about that coming up. Questions so far? Anybody? 
All right, let's look at the uh, let's do the uh, let's look at the Elmo. All right, so things that are chiral and things that are not chiral. Okay, so here's our plane of symmetry in the middle there. Okay, so I have this pumpkin I still have left over from Halloween. So um, is that chiral? The, well, we can slice it in half, but the, the right half to, and the left half do not exactly line up, so that pumpkin is chiral. You didn't even know that about pumpkins, okay? You could probably make a plastic one that was exactly the same on both sides, it would be achiral. Here's our two molecules. We have a, this is our alkene, so if you can see it that way, there's our alkene. And there's the other alkene. There are mirror images of each other, right? Um, but I can, act, I can take this molecule right here and I can flip it over and all the bonds exactly line up. Okay, so that means that this molecule um, is achiral. Because this mirror image is superimposable. All right, these guys, let me see. I, don't, I, I just grabbed these, so I don't know if they're... Let's see, I gotta switch two of these groups here. Let's see if I did that right. So definitely if you have not opened your models up, yeah, to see what I did is I switched them and I put them right back in the same spot that they already were. So. Okay. You'll find yourself doing the same thing. All right, I want these to be mirror images of each other. Okay, so now they're mirror images of each other. Everybody see that? Okay, they're mirror images, right? Now let's see if they're superimposable. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna, I'm gonna flip this over and I'm gonna try to line up bonds. I can line up two of the bonds. I can line up two of the bonds. I can line up the green and the orange. I cannot, but if I do that, the blue and the yellow are not lined up. They're switched. I could line up the blue and the yellow. There's no trickery here. Um, I can line up the blue and the yellow. If I line up the blue and the yellow, the orange and the green don't line up. So these are mirror images. Let's put them back as mirror images. They're mirror images that are not superimposable. So they're chiral, each one is chiral. In order for me to change this molecule to this one, I have to switch two groups. This time I'm gonna pay more attention. I have to take two bonds out and switch them. All right, and if I do that, Everything's superimposable, see? But you know what, now that I've done that, they're not mirror images anymore. Okay, so enantiomers are really unique. They're, these guys are not mirror images anymore because I've taken two bonds and switched them. All right, um, something else I want to show you here. This is cyclohexane. Now, your models that you have, the blue, if you have the green ones, they make better chairs than this one because these are a little bit too flexible. So now I'm going to try, I'm trying to line that up. It's kind of shadowy, isn't it? Can you see that? We can't make that shadow go away. Oh well. What's better? Anyway, okay, so what are you thinking? Is that chiral or achiral? All right, well I have the, that's the, the red is an oxygen and the oxygen is bonded to a hydrogen. And if I put it in that conformation with that hydroxyl over to the right, that hydrogen to the right, then it's, then it doesn't have a plane of symmetry. But if I, if I rotate it like this, I can slice that, right? 
So I'm going to slice, I'm going to slice that bond, I'm going to slice that bond, I'm going to slice that bond. That side is the exact reflection of the other side. So it is a chiral or achiral? It's achiral. All you need to do is find one orientation where there's a plane of symmetry. You can always rotate things so there's no plane of symmetry, but you just have to find one that has a plane of symmetry and that automatically means that the molecule is achiral. Okay? And the other thing is, is that um, here's, our, here's our hydroxyl, this carbon, this carbon right here, what is it bonded to? We're going to look, at, look for a tetrahedral carbon. That, at that tetrahedral carbon certainly has um, four different, well, it has four, two substituents that are the same. So how would we do that? That carbon's bonded to a hydrogen that's coming, popping up. It's bonded to a hydroxyl. The other two groups are the two sides of the ring. If we trace the ring around to the left, that's one substituent. And if we trace the ring around to the, or that's to the right, if we trace it around to the left, that's another substituent. And that substituent, and that substituent, even though it's the same ring, they count as two substituents, are identical. We, we encounter the same groups as we're going away. So that carbon right here is a stereocenter, and it is the only stereocenter in the molecule. This carbon right here is not a stereocenter, it has two hydrogens. This carbon right here, 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 and here is not a stereocenter, it has two hydrogens. So we said that if we have one stereocenter, um, the molecule is chiral. Well, this doesn't have any stereocenters. Okay, so it's, it's achiral. So there's, those are our two tricks to look for things. Questions? Anybody? All right. Um, let me do something here. I'm going to make one more. I just thought of this off the top of my head. Let's look at this molecule right here. All right. Well, certainly um, it, doesn't have a, it doesn't look like it has a plane of symmetry, right? Because we have green this way, yellow this way. And um, do we have stereocenters? How many stereocenters do we have? We have two stereocenters. Uh, this carbon right here. Um, let me use the. Let me use this. This carbon right here is bonded to a, a yellow, a green, a blue, and this um, I don't know methyly kind of looking thing. Um, same thing over here. This carbon here is bonded to green, blue, yellow, and this other group right over here. Now, if I switch, uh, I'm going to switch the green and the yellow. So we have two stereocenters, right? I'm going to switch the green and yellow on this side. Do we still have two stereocenters? Yeah, we do. We actually do. Each carbon is bonded to four different things. But now, do you see we have a plane of symmetry? So it has two stereocenters, but it's achiral. So we said if there's one stereocenter, it's automatically chiral. If there's two, we, it can be chiral or achiral. I first showed you chiral. This is achiral. Okay? So that's just a little visual before we start moving on to talk more in depth. Any questions? All right. Where? Right here. Yes. I don't have butane, but you can come to my office and we'll look at it. Okay? I don't have butane with me. All right. Okay. So let's talk about drawing enantiomers. We, uh, we use 3D dash wedge to draw enantiomers. So here's a, a, a sample question here. Draw the enantiomers of the following compound using 3D formulas. So 3D meaning dash and wedge. So first we want to find uh, any stereocenters. We 
draw in the tetrahedral skeleton. and fill in substituents. And definitely you want to take a look at the handout and drawing stereoisomers. It's under the practice link of our website. Okay, ways to draw stereoisomers in ways that are not going to be that will that are not correct. So I'm going to draw in the skeleton here. I'm just going to do it, and I, I you'll find that you'll favor one way or another based on whether you're right or left-handed. But I'm going to draw my carbon skeleton like this. So I draw I draw two bonds in the plane of the paper, and I'm trying to attempt to do 109.5, and then the other two. The dash and the wedge are close together. Now that's not what the bond angle is, but remember one of these is coming up and one of these is coming down. So we put those two together on the opposite side. So um, and now if I, and now I'm just going to distribute the substituents here. So this met this carbon right here is a hydrogen. I'll put the hydrogen here. I could put it wherever I want, really. The methyl it has also also attached to a methyl, so we'll use CH3 for that. It's attached to a bromine. I'll put bromine here. And then we also have a CH2OH group. So that would be CH2OH here. So that's one enantiomer. And now I'm going to draw the mirror image because it says to draw both enantiomers. There's actually two ways to do this. You can draw the mirror image. And so that's what I'll do first. Some people have trouble with this. So I'll show you another way to do it. So that's the mirror image. So draw a mirror image. Or when we had our models over there, we saw we said that if we want to change from one enantiomer to the other, we have to take physically remove two bonds and switch them. So that's another way to draw an enantiomer, switch any two groups, any two groups. All right, so I'm going to redraw it the way I originally had it. There's my skeleton. Which groups do you want to switch? Bromine and CH2OH. Bromine and the CH2OH. Okay, we'll put bromine here and CH2OH here. We're going to leave the hydrogen and the methyl exactly where they are. So we're giving you two ways to do this. To draw the enantiomer, you can draw the mirror image or switch two groups. Don't draw the mirror image and switch two groups or you're going to be right back to the original enantiomer. So um, on your own, here's what I recommend that you do. Make this model, make this model and you'll see that they're enantiomers of each other. And, but um, also make this the way it's shown and make this and you'll see that those are identical. So you make the model, one enantiomer will be superimposable on the other. We're not ready yet. We've got two more minutes. So this is the other enantiomer. All right, so how do we detect enantiomers? How do we know we have, if we have one enantiomer or the other? Um, one of the ways that we could do that is to use optical activity. So enantiomers have identical boiling point, melting point, solubility, index of refraction, IR, NMR, and achiral solvent, etc. What, what's different about them is when they interact with other chiral substances and when they interact with plain polarized light. 
So uh, enantiomers rotate the plane of polarized light by exactly the same amount but in the opposite direction. So um, another, word, another way to say this is they have opposite specific rotations. All right, we will stop right there and we'll talk more about what that means next time.